Good morning, everyone. I'm Emma Hegel, the Senior Events Manager at the Canadian Marketing Association, and welcome to this morning's Marketing Connected Live. Firstly, I hope everyone is doing well and continuing to stay safe during these difficult times. Before we get started, I quickly wanted to mention that should you have any questions for the speakers during today's session, please use the Q&A feature to submit these. Questions will be addressed at the end of the discussion. All right, this morning, CMA's president and CEO, John Wiltshire, will be chatting to Tony Johnstone, former chief brand officer at DDB, about how businesses and brands can survive and thrive as we approach recovery. Please join me in a virtual applause in welcoming them. Thanks, Emma. It's great to be with you all this morning, and I echo uh, Emma's comment about uh, being well and staying safe in these uh, these darker days. Uh, um, I, I have with me today Tony Johnstone. Um, we go back a, a, a fair amount of uh, uh, years in terms of working with one another. Uh, Tony's also a friend. Tony, welcome uh, to Marketing Connected Live. It's good to see your face. Thanks, John, and uh, welcome to everybody from sunny Prince Edward County. Yes, Tony has a shack in the in Prince Edward County, and I've been there, and it's not, it's a it's, it's a very nice shack. Uh, and I would say that Tony makes a mean omelet. One of the other things that probably a lot of people don't know about you, Tony, is that you actually play in a rock and roll band. Yes, uh, being a good Liverpool boy, hence the strange accent, um, obviously love all things Beatles, and got into the guitar at an early age, and yes, have continued my passion in my later years. Who Stole the Cookies is the name of the band, and you can check us out, whostolethecookies.com. Free advertising. There you go. Like, like a good, uh, like a good advertising guy. So, um, it, it, Tony, you and I go back to uh, you. Really helped um, me with the Investors Group brand a few years ago, and and did some great work together to uh, to, to you know, revitalize that brand. Um, as we're coming into this period of time, um, you know, you, you're making quite the statement. You're, you're 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 actually sounding the alarm for brands. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, there seems to be a confluence of, of things happening. Uh, one, obviously, is the dreaded COVID-19, which is changing behavior. And, you know, the word dark is used in many articles and by many people. But the consequence of that is the recession that we are now deeply in. And my concern in the article that I wrote was that all of the surrounding issues with COVID-19 seem to be getting in the way of we are entering a very deep recession where discretionary income is going to be hit hard so as a brand having to fight for those dollars is going to become a big issue which is why i use the word dogfight yeah in the article which i would encourage people to read uh, another point that you make is that you know brands uh the brand loyalty assumptions that people make about their brands have been disrupted in this period of time in a unique way. Uh, and have we seen this in other recessions or is this time different? Well, in every recession we see, we do see people switching brands. They're forced to because of the, the monetary implications. So they will, they will switch down. They, they will buy second tier brands, own label brands. And we, we see that during every major recession. I think one big difference here is people were forced to change their buying patterns often because of a supply chain issue. Again, I mentioned we ended up buying Hunt's ketchup instead of Heinz. I worked on Heinz many years ago at Leo Burnett. I've always been a passionate fan, but it wasn't available. And we had a big house. We had been isolating with a big household. Um, so we needed ketchup and Hunt's became the choice. And I have to say, having brought it into the household, I think we'll probably stay with it. Uh, right. There wasn't a huge amount of trade-off. So, so there have been some forced behavioral changes. The big question then is, will people stay with them, especially in recessionary periods, or right. will they go back to the habits that the they habits. Yeah. had previously? Yeah, so it, it, you get into it. You, you have six steps. of uh, your, your prescription is uh, it involves six medicines, uh, so to speak, and... Uh, um, and in a way of recovering and actually doing well into the period of recovery. And the first step you mentioned is really 
um, determining what you need in the way of business, like where is that business going to come from? Obviously, that's pretty, pretty logical. I'm a business guy. Um, it, in your view, is this a common place that you know brand managers and brand executives start? Well, it, it should be. Uh, as you say, it's, it's not rocket science to figure out who you, who you are going to be targeting as a customer base. I think a, a couple of things have happened, though. Uh, firstly, buying patterns, as we mentioned, have changed. But interestingly, many more men are now buying, going to the supermarket than, than women. I know my brother-in-law is constantly in trouble for buying the wrong brand, you know, because the, the list, the shopping list still contains the category. I need you to buy bleach, toilet paper, wine. And he's not as au fait with the household brand needs as some. So he's buying brands that, that hitherto, again, have not been in the household. My question to, to marketers is, do you really understand who's buying? And I right. guess, just as importantly, who's influencing? Right. Uh, a, a quick example, a friend of mine down the road here has a kayak business. He's finding that, in fact, his millennial target is no longer buying the kayaks. It's, it tends to be middle-aged people who are as empty nesters and have a little more money and are able to weather the recession better. And he only discovered that three months ago. So that first piece is just go back to basics, take a good look at who you think is core to your business, figure out transactions, and then figure out from there on in how it is that you can engage those people to, to desire your brand more than any other brand. Yeah, and I guess that's the, your, your second point is about mental availability. It's about behavioral economics. And I, I, I assume that these, again, are kind of evergreen concepts. Um, and and you're, you're, you're saying, I think, that these mental associations have been impacted uh, in this time. Uh, and the question is, um, what's going to happen in the future? No one has a crystal ball, but are there... Are you viewing things so far that might uh, suggest a sense of disruption? Um, I, I mean, just going back to the mental availability thing is really important because increasingly we do have a mental shortlist when we shop, whether it's right. beyond you know, physically. And there's a lot of evidence that suggests if you're not in the top three of brands that come to mind when a category is named, it's very unlikely you're going to get much business. I know when I worked in the car category, essentially, uh, even with all of the online information available, if, if a brand wasn't mentioned in the top three, uh, in only 13, one, three percent of times, right. was it purchased outside of that top three? So it's important that brands have some saliency, have some yeah. presence doesn't need to be advertising. It can be doing things for people that they find interesting and powerful and memorable. But it is very, very important that brands don't just go dark. And unfortunately, I think a lot of brands are in yeah. paralysis mode right now. Right. And it tends then to be the brands that uh, are more popular that, that they're doing well. Yeah, it, 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 that's interesting. It leads kind of into the next point, which is, is making sure that you you have a distinctive promise and and in in there you're talking a little bit about the you know the temptation at the executive level to uh, yeah, simply you know cut price and sell 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 um, and, yeah I've actually witnessed that a little bit uh, through advertising uh, on some of the uh, the uh, luxury auto brands um, and uh, are you recommending to resist that temptation I assume. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the problem is always if you cut price, you likely will increase your volume, but you're killing your margins. And so you need to get way more volume just to stay where you would have been if you sold at full price to less people. There's another thing that happens is when you discount, for the most part, people have a kind of query about, I wonder why they're doing that. That seems a bit strange, particularly from premium typically premium price brands. So there's a psychological piece that happens. So my advice is if you can sell at full price and you can find a compelling promise that differentiates you and behave in a way that reinforces that promise, 
you'll get much further, much faster than bribery uh, and discounting, which is a very short-term activation tactic. Right. Um, fair enough. Um, yeah, the next point in your uh, treatise or your uh, prescription is, is, is like, like a good brand guy, you're talking about making sure that you're connecting emotionally, your brand is connecting emotionally with your audience. Um, any ideas of who's doing that well right now? Uh, and, and, and how do we know, you know, how people are feeling right now to connect emotionally? There's a lot of been a lot of me too is a lot of kind of thrusting with, you know, we we're with you, we feel for you, front care, line workers, all that stuff. What's your view of some of that? Yeah. I give you three questions or you can pick any of the three you want to answer. So, so let's, let's start with the first one. Emotion, if you look at the likes of Daniel Kahneman, behavioral economists, well, right. they will tell you that emotion drives 95% of all sales. Right. The dilemma is it, it's, a, it's a tricky one for marketers to embrace because it seems a bit of a, a soft, um, hard to quantify way into the market. And consequently, it's much easier to say, oh, no, we're going to do something that's very physical and tangible. And we will, if it's a fruit juice, we're going to talk about the fruit because we know that's tangible. And we'll tell them we have 80% of our product is, is fruit untouched. The dilemma with that is it doesn't actually get you into the consideration stage. Before I consider your fruit benefit, I need to emotionally engage with you and I need to like you. Let's go back to the old adage of, you meet somebody at a party, really you're judging them on, did I, did I like them? I didn't know anything about them. Were they interesting? Were they fun? Did they tell yeah. jokes? Did we have similar interests? So that's what brands need to stop intruding on people with messages that are functionally based. There is a role for that as reinforcement, but first and foremost, it needs to be an emotional play. So the second part of your question, I think, was, but aren't most brands doing that? during these troubling times? Yeah. And the answer is very much they are, but it also, it, it blends because there's very little differentiation in the tonality and the way in which brands are presenting that message. And what I think is intriguing is take a brand like Budweiser, which had the amazing campaign Was Up all those years back. It brought that back into play and made people smile because it's made it very contemporary and relevant you know, what are you doing, Joe? Oh, yeah. just chilling, just isolating. <laughs> you know, having a cold one, drinking a bud. Yeah. What's up with you? Really good, yeah. So that's an emotional play that has very good connectedness to the brand and is making people smile. I, I, I'm a bit shocked that more brands aren't embracing it. Yes, it's tough times. Yes, there are deaths involved. It's a serious time. But people also have lives and they need to be uplifted. And I do think that more and more brands need to understand that presenting your brand in an entertaining way that is emotionally interesting and engaging is not a bad thing. It's not a waste of money. It, it is a way in which you can really get some saliency and get into that mental shortlist. So it just needs to be done more regularly and more money needs to be spent behind it. But I do think it's a challenge for Canadian marketers because it's not as easy a sell to the CEO and to the board that the strategy here is we're going to spend 60% of the money getting people to feel good about us and to engage with us emotionally and 40% telling people why we're better. But in fact, they are the kind of proportions that a lot of evidence, right. uh, particularly from Burnett and Field in the UK, will tell you is is the way in which you can you can win um and, and that hasn't changed even though some circumstances have yeah yeah i i saw your your i read about your 10 poles and 10 pigs analogy i had to read it twice i, I gotta say it didn't emotionally connect with me i'm more i do love uh, the outdoors and i love hiking and stuff like that but i'm more of a luxury hotel guy uh it, it yeah. actually brought back the evoked, evoked uh, some negative memories of tenting when i was younger um but mm -hmm. having said that um you know i the, the whole notion of, of allocating a certain percentage of your marketing budget towards more sales oriented activation uh, ver versus brand building, I think it is a, it is a difficult conversation for people to have these days. Um, 
but in, in some ways, if you don't, it, it, you're, you're almost going back to that point we made earlier that you made about, you know, you're, you're just discounting a price. So, I mean, it's, it's another form of discounting, you're just trying to pump through the sales and not spending enough time and effort on building long-term brand loyalty, which is the whole gist of the thing, right? Yeah, and I, I, there's, there's one kind of point of deviation for me that, that where I differ a little bit with some of the observers about long-term, short-term. When you lead with emotion, when, when your, your tent poles, the piece that holds the tent up, the four or five pieces, as opposed to the tent pegs, which are little activation programs, when you do those well, um, what happens is you do what psychologists call you emotionally prime people right. for the sales message. And if you don't emotionally prime them, they are less receptive. So, so by that, I mean, there was a wonderful John Lewis Christmas company a couple of years back, and they used the boxer dog, and it was about a little girl having a trampoline in the back garden. The dad it was beautifully filmed. The dad erected it, and all the wildlife tried it out before the, before the little girl did. And when she got up Christmas morning and went to it, the boxer ran out first and did these wonderful exercises bouncing on the trampoline. So, so that, that boxer dog became a very powerful icon. They spent about 70% on the film online and on, and on TV, but they were able to just use the boxer to provide a, a plethora of short-term sales messages. And people connected with it very quickly. And the sales for the, for that, Christmas period were two and a half times stronger than the previous year, which was also very, you know, a big lift versus the year right. before that. So th that's my point of don't think that by going emotional, it's only for the long term. Going emotional can get you short term sales because it makes your messaging um, so much more effective. It, it goes back to those mental shortcuts. And you know, that's the reason why Snap, Crack, and Pop for Kellogg's all those years back uh, was essentially a, short, a, short, a mental shortcut to try and get people to remember, oh, yeah. that's the brand from Kellogg called Rice Krispies. And you just show those little characters, and apart from all the merchandising opportunities, the brand starts to come to the front of mind. So, so yeah, that, that's the only thing I would say. Emotion builds long term, which is great. You have a business down the road. But it actually powers short-term, you know, immediate sales effects uh, if you do it right. Yeah, and I think that's a great uh, going back to the uh, around the grouping around the CEO table or the uh, C-suite, and you're having these arguments. You don't have to make the argument for long-term versus short-term. I think that's a really good, um, a really good idea for people in these days. Um, your last point before we go to questions is. Um, you know, is about the visual distinctiveness of brands and making sure um, that it's it, it, it's done right, particularly in this time. Um, let me ask you a, a, a bit of a swing question here. Like, is is now a good time for redoing your visual distinctiveness, or we like, what's your views on that, or do you have any? You know, I always have a view, John. <laughs> I have a view on everything. Um, I do. I, I do think that what I call brand iconography is, right. a, is a much maligned practice sure. and needs a lot more attention, uh, particularly in, in a time when there's messaging overload. So as you mentioned earlier in the piece, a number of brands have done some very good things. Brands that were brewing alcohol that have become hand sanitizers. Yeah. Uh, brands that supermarkets that were opening up an hour earlier for the more vulnerable members of society to go and shop. Um, the, the dilemma is because there is such little brand linkage to the messaging often, it all blends. And so you don't know who was doing what. And, right. and that's a big opportunity missed. So, yeah, I do, I do think that, that that whole piece is, is so, so important. Uh, Way back in the day, jingles were jingles for a reason. It's because, again, they lodged in people's brains and you associated it strongly with the brand. I think uh, Netflix and Intel with the, with the kind of oral uh, earworm type brand iconography are, are doing very well. And that's an important piece. And then color schemes are also the, the yellow and black of Best Buy, for instance, the red and white of Coca-Cola. 
I just feel more um, more thought needs to be applied to this particular linkage piece. And, and often it's not, it's an afterthought and, uh, and, and it shouldn't be because it can really help you again, get consideration, put you front of mind and ultimately get those lost sales that every CEO is desperate to, to achieve these days. Great. No, thank you for that. Well, th that's a good list of, uh, of things to do and, and, um, areas to consider. I, I think that's great. We, we do have one question that's come in, um, and I'll, I'll read it, um, here. Um, uh, and, um, um, it says you and John spoke earlier about luxury car brands in your mind, what is the future for luxury brands in Canada? Um, or, I mean, maybe I'll add to that and just say like, what, you know, if you if you're if you're taking care of a luxury brand now, what are some of the considerations that you should have about that brand? Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think the same consideration as as any other brand. So, if you have a luxury brand, figure out who is your target. Is it the same target? Is it the same customer profile as historically you have had, or has it changed? Is it moving on? Uh, so that would be number one. I, I, as I say, remember there's a, there is a recession going on. There will be some groups that get hit harder than others, and those groups may not be who you think. People that historically are quite wealthy and have lots of investments and empty nesters, uh, not all empty nesters have lots of money to play with. So perhaps if that isn't the core group, perhaps there's another core group that needs to be explored. I think that luxury will do quite well. Certainly in China, the day that lockdown was lifted, Hermé, uh, the store in Shanghai, had sales of 2.7 million US dollars in one day because there was a pent-up demand from wealthier. Interestingly, again, according to our friends at Kantar, the shopper profile, though, was not, uh, it was not skewed by age. It was a very... It was, it, was, it was just the mindset and, and people with money and it was young and old and middle-aged everything in between um so i think it's the same the same concepts is understand keep your head up look at the target understand whether your positioning is as relevant now as it always has been because times they are changing and and positions change in people's minds figure out from a salience perspective are you in the same place have you moved forward are you have you moved backwards and what luxury does very well generally is for strong emotional connections. So right. keep, keep those going and make sure it's really well branded and that you have strong iconography so that people get the messaging. That's great. No, and it's terrific. And you know, the, the thing that's reassuring to me in this discussion about uh, managing brands are that most of these, these concepts you put out are evergreen concepts. It's just, you got to get at it at this point in time and make sure you're, you're using facts to, to lead you to changes that you might make in your programs and whatnot. Uh, thanks so much for your time, Tony. It's been a, a delight as always to, to speak with you and um, I hope to see you around soon in person. Okay. Same here. Thanks okay. for having me. Back to you, Emma. Thank you very much, Tony and John, for that great conversation this morning. Uh, and thank you everyone for your questions and for tuning in today. We will be sending out a recording of this uh, and details for our next Marketing Connected Live, which will be taking place on June 16th with Steve Mast, the President and Chief Innovation Officer at Delvinia. And in case you missed any of our other previous Marketing Connected Live webinars, we'll also be sending you details uh, to check those out on our website as well. These are complimentary to members and non-members uh, during these times. Thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.